The 1980s were peak cola wars. Coke was losing its number one position and the Pepsi challenge was everywhere. And there was nowhere to go other than take this escalating rivalry to an entirely new frontier. And that was space. Researchers and no doubt marketing people from Coca-Cola had the idea of making a carbonated beverage and can that could be taken into space. And they approached NASA and got approval for the project. But when Pepsi heard about this, they were not impressed. And they went as far as taking the issue all the way to the White House. They said that this was unfair and couldn't happen. And supposedly that then President Reagan was a Pepsi drinker. So NASA actually delayed Coke's launch and said that Pepsi could participate if it could create a can that passed its safety tests. Now they failed once, but eventually got a can across the line, and the cola space race was on. Now there are some technical challenges with dealing with carbonated beverages in weightless environments and on spacecraft. Having a can explode with liquids going everywhere is clearly a bad idea. Dealing with carbonation and bubbles is interesting. And providing food and drink that astronauts enjoy are all things that do have some value. And that's probably the reason that NASA said yes to this. And the mission that this experiment would take place was STF... ST the mission that this experiment would take place was STS-51F, or Space Lab 2, on board the Space Shuttle Challenger. Now this mission would also include plasma physics, high energy astrophysics, atmospheric and solar studies. But invariably it was the COLA test that got a lot more attention, with one astronaut saying, this stupid thing was taking more time than our serious experiments, but we all took it in pretty good humour. Well, that was until the Chief Counsel of NASA came in to brief them on the COLA testing protocols and he lost it, saying, we don't have time to talk about this stupid carbonated beverage dispenser test. Please leave. Now, Coke claimed they spent $250,000 on their design, while Pepsi claimed their research and development budget ran to an astonishing $14 million. Although one astronaut thinks that this is likely an exaggeration, saying, quote, the Pepsi can when it showed up looked like a shaving cream can. In fact, the Pepsi logo was just stuck on a paper wrapper. And when we peeled it off, indeed, it was just a shaving cream can. It still had the shaving cream logo on it. Pepsi understood this had nothing whatsoever to do with soda in space. It had to do with PR. I love that. They just poured Pepsi into a shaving cream can and sent it into space. Classic. The space shuttle headed to space and they worked out how the experiment would work. The team was split into two shifts, and half would try the Coke and half would try the Pepsi. And one astronaut, John David Bartow, thought the whole thing went too far and opted out of it entirely, saying, quote, I thought it was frivolous and detracting from the science of the mission. I'm not going to do it. I think it's a terrible idea. But before I share the results and the fallout from the tests, I want to show you what I'm doing. I've come to a back alley in Chicago, part of the University of Chicago, where a piece of cosmic ray equipment has sat for years. And this is a piece of equipment that actually flew on that exact flight where the COLA test was done. Because I'm really fascinated in the difference between these two things. The reach of the real science and that which grabs the public attention. So this is the Chicago Egg and it's a two and a half ton cosmic ray detector. One of the largest pieces of scientific equipment to ever fly on a NASA shuttle. And it's the work of scientist Dietrich Muller, who was a renowned experimental physicist who spent decades building equipment like this to do things like study cosmic rays and particles. Now this equipment only flew on that single flight, but Muller's other work included designing balloon flights over Antarctica, and developing a spectrometry technique that's used today in the International Space Station. So while this scientifically rigorous work was happening on the space flight, the media, and me right now to be fair, is talking about COLA. So what's the deal with that? It turns out this actually isn't that unusual in the world of science. Many scientists are best known for something which is far away from their most important contributions. As an example, new species are discovered every day, but often take something unusual, like naming it after a celebrity to get mainstream media cut through. Like Neopulpa Donald Trumpi, which is a type of moth with a yellowish, whitish head, reminiscent of the former president, with the biologist saying he wanted to, quote, bring wider public attention to the need to continue to protect fragile habitats in the US that still contain many undescribed species. Or Scaptia Beyonce, a species of horsefly named after the pop singer as it had a big gold butt, with the biologist saying, quote, it was the unique dense golden hairs on the fly's abdomen that led me to name this fly in honor of the performer Beyonce, as well as giving me the chance to demonstrate the fun side of taxonomy, the naming of species. Because from a biological perspective, it doesn't really matter what these animals are named, but it does make a massive difference in the media. So should scientists go down this path of media-friendly science, or is it all just a bit of a distraction? In August 1985, 265 kilometers above Earth, for the first time in human histories, humans tried cola in space. And what were the results? In short, meh. 
The cans seemed to work fine, they didn't explode, they did their basic job of dispensing liquid. But there wasn't a refrigerator on board, so the cans were delivering cola at room temperature. The Pepsi can released these balls of soda filled with bubbles, which was supposedly fun to play with in Zero G, but not so drinkable. Because the thing is, on Earth, the bubbles come up and they leave. While without gravity, they just kind of sit there, leading to the issue of, quote, wet burps. Uh. One astronaut said, So here you are with this stomach full of carbonated beverage with the gases just kind of comfortably staying there. Generally, the powdered drink Tang was considered better, and it's worth noting that NASA didn't pursue this any further. But did the cola companies care that the astronauts didn't like it? Not at all. This was a marketing opportunity. NASA deliberately split the groups in half so they didn't have to answer questions about which was better. Instead, Coke focused on the winning the space wars because the team that tried their drink did it first by about eight hours. So they went with the line, Coca-Cola, the first choice in refreshment around the world is now the first soft drink tasted in space. While Pepsi went with one giant sip for mankind. It was Pepsi in a shaving cream can. Now I'm sure there's a balance here, but generally scientists like the chance to share their work. And yes, that sometimes involves talking about parts of it which isn't core, but the thing that people are more likely to engage with. So I'll leave the last words to the astronauts who were involved in this mission. Astronaut Loren Acton said, When I'm giving talks in schools, they're a lot more interested in Coke and Pepsi than they are in solar physics. And that astronaut that I mentioned who opted out said in an interview 35 years after the fact, in retrospect, that was a really dumb thing for me to do. From an aging piece of space equipment in Chicago, I'm Julian O'Shea.